Cervical Radiculopathy, presented by Alex Johnson and Rebecca Lander. Prevalence of Cervical Radiculopathy. According to Cleveland et al., the annual incidence of cervical radiculopathy is approximately 83 people per 100,000. There is an increased prevalence in the fifth decade of life, occurring with 200 people per 100,000. Gold Standard of Diagnosis. Currently, there is no gold standard for medical diagnosis except a thorough patient history, which should direct the clinician in the direction of cervical radiculopathy. However, the gold standard for surgical treatment of, of radiculopathy is anterior cervical decompression and fusion. Clinicians have reported some concerns about this treatment as it tends to create hypermobility in the adjacent segments and hypomobility overall. You can use imaging to create a diagnosis. An x-ray will indicate narrowing of the foramen, thus damaging the intervertebral discs. An MRI will indicate the presence of a herniated disc, compressing the nerve, and an EMG can be used to determine if the affected nerve is functioning correctly. One of the better research methods of diagnosing cervical radiculopathy is the diagnostic cluster developed by Weiner et al. This cluster consists of the following, a positive upper limb tension test biasing the median nerve, positive neck distraction, positive Sperling's test, and decreased active cervical range of motion of less than 60 degrees to the affected side. The cluster demonstrates 94 specificity for diagnosing cervical radiculopathy with three out of five positive tests. This cluster demonstrates 99% specificity for diagnosing cervical radiculopathy with four out of five positive tests. And these two are the Sperling's and the upper limb tension test of the median nerve. This is Sperling's B, and to perform that, you'll have your patient seated. Ask the patient to look at their back pocket. If this elicits their pain, then that's a positive test, and you can move on throughout the cluster. If it does not bring on their pain, though, then the therapist standing behind the patient will apply a compressive force through the top of their head and through the neck. If this elicits their familiar pain, then that's a positive Sperling's B. Per be sure to perform the test on both sides. The upper limb tension test biasing the median nerve is here, and this test progressively loads the median nerve. Throughout the test, be sure to ask if the patient's familiar pain has been reproduced with each additional loading movement. First, depress the shoulder using your forearm. Abduct the shoulder to 90 degrees with the elbow bent. Maximally externally rotate the shoulder, supinate the forearm, extend the wrist and the fingers, and then extend the elbow. Wherever the patient experiences their familiar pain, the, pace, the therapist should release that position just enough for the symptoms to subside. Ask the patient to bring their opposite ear of the test side of the opposite opposite ear to the opposite test side and bring it to their shoulder. If this elicits their familiar symptoms, then that would be a positive finding. To perform cervical distraction, which is not pictured here, the patient is supine. The, the therapist places their hands on the base of the occiput and applies a linear distraction force. If the patient's symptoms are reduced by cervical distraction, then that would be a positive finding. To measure active range of motion, use a goniometer. The axis will be on the, over the center of the patient's head. Stationary arm lines up with the patient's AC joint, and the movement arm aligns with the tip of the nose. If the rotation to the affected side is less than 60, then that would be a positive finding for the diagnostic cluster. And these are some images demonstrating cervical radiculopathy. This is an MRI, and it's showing intervertebral disc herniation of C4, C5, C5, C6, and these will create radiating symptoms down the arm, potentially. This is an artist-enhanced rendition of an x-ray of the cervical spine, and this is demonstrating narrowing of the foramen, which would create pain along those nerve lines. Signs and symptoms. Patients with cervical radiculopathy typically complain of neck pain accompanied by tingling and numbness radiating down the arm. Pain can vary from a deep, dull ache to a sharp burning pain. They may also complain of weakness in the affected extremity as well as loss of sensation. Patient's pain is typically aggravated by rotation to the affected side and extension. Patient's pain is typically alleviated by shoulder abduction. 
These are the common nerve root patterns associated with cervical radiculopathy. Patients present with symptoms consistent with a particular nerve root. However, not all patients will fit neatly into one category, so it's important to take a thorough history and perform a thorough examination. Clinical findings during a physical exam. Patients present with different um, symptoms depending on their level of cervical radiculopathy. The following clinical tests have shown high specificity for cervical radiculopathy. So the Sperling's test, which we discussed earlier, Valsava maneuver, shoulder abduction, cervical hyperflexion, cervical hyperextension, and cervical distraction, which we discussed as well. Evidence-based recommendations for physical therapy. Um, these are just a few ways to help your patients suffering from cervical radiculopathy. You can provide cervical traction, manual therapy, soft tissue massage, or pavums um, to help make more space in those compressed areas. They can strengthen their deep neck flexors. You can also develop cervicothoracic stabilization exercises, so scapular retraction strengthening the rhomboids and the serratus punch to stabilize the serratus anterior and strengthen it as well. It's also important to educate your parents, your patients on lifestyle ergonomics. So um, how they sit, their posture, whether they're working on a computer all day and how they're positioning their arms. And also finding out those repetitive movements that elicit their pain and what movements are alleviating their pain. And it shows that, research shows that a patient will progress successfully with a multimodal treatment approach. Not one treatment on its own has been shown to successfully treat cervical radiculopathy, so it's good to have a lot of options. Prognosis. The following are predictors for, of positive short-term outcomes for patients with a clinical diagnosis of cervical radiculopathy, according to Cleland et al. They are less than 54 years old. Their dominant arm is not affected. Looking down does not worsen their symptoms. And they've received multimodal treatment for at least 50% of their visits. If three out of four variables are present, present then they, there's a positive likelihood ratio of 5.2 and post-test probability of success was 85%. And if all the variables were present, the positive likelihood ratio was 8.3 and post-test probability of success was 90%. Outcome measures. The Neck Disability Index, or NDI, is a self-report questionnaire used to assess how neck pain affects the patient's quality of life. The NDI consists of 10 questions involving pain intensity, personal care, lifting, headaches, reading, concentration, work, driving, sleeping, and recreation. Each question contains six answer choices, scored from zero, no disability, to five, complete disability. All section scores are then totaled. Scoring is reported on a zero to 50 scale, zero being the best possible score and 50 being the worst. According to Cleland et al., the MCID for cervical radiculopathy is 7.0 on a scale of zero to 50 and the MDC is 10.2 on a scale of zero to 50. Patient specific functional scale is used to assess functional ability to complete specific activities. Patients rate their ability to complete an activity on an 11 point scale at a level experienced prior to their injury or change in functional status. Zero represents unable to perform and 10 represents able to perform at their prior level. Patients select a value that best describes their current level of ability on each activity assessed. And the MDC for that test is one point for no radicular symptoms, and the MCID is two points for cervical radiculopathy. These are our references, and we hope you gain some insight to cervical radiculopathy. Thank you.